I'd like to introduce our presenter, Pamela Hayes. Uh, she's a board certified registered art therapist. For all the credentials. Fancy. Plus, a licensed marriage family therapist. Been practicing over 20 years. So, read lots of experience, <laughs> lots of knowledge. And um, she's also a national lecturer. She teaches around the country for continuing education series. I guess it's through PESI now, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And prior to PESI. And uh, has her prior practice in Encino. And her specialties include drug and alcohol addiction treatment, uh, foster care and adoption issues, parenting skills, gender identity, relationships, depression, and anxiety as grief, as well as grief. And uh, she's a court certified sexual abuse evaluator, uh, trained in EMDR uh, and EFT. And she is also has taught art therapy courses at Rhode Island School of Design. Mm -hmm. Also fancy. Real, a real place to go, <laughs> yeah. Right. And the Chicago School and Phillips University. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she's not doing all that, she paints. <laughs> she's a runner. A black belt in mixed martial arts. Yeah. Don't, don't mess with her. That's right. <laughs> she's also a mother, and she's trained for the AIDS ride. So, oh, I wow. am yeah. doing the AIDS ride. Yes. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for gifting us with your presentation yeah. on art therapy and sexuality. Please welcome Pamela Hayes. Hey. Thank you guys for being here today. So my name is Pamela Melkoff Hayes. Um, Douglas went through all of my things. He said I was practicing for over 20 years. It's been more like 27. <laughs> Yikes. Um, and you guys have all this information in your handouts, but please feel free to contact me if you have any questions after today. I know we have limited time, so you can, um, you can go to my website or email me directly and um, all that's in there. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. That's that's me. I don't want to waste time on that. What I really want to do is I want to really hand you guys a whole bunch of interventions today, okay? Um, but I have to I have to say my caveat here. If you are not an art therapist, you cannot call yourself an art therapist, or you can't say you're doing art therapy. But my feeling is anybody can go to. CVS or Walmart and buy crayons and markers and uh, and you can make art and it's therapeutic, right? So and I know a lot of therapists out there are doing that and um, It's important to me that people know how to do it effectively Okay, so uh, you could use language like I incorporate art into my work or I use art therapeutically Just be careful about the language of art therapy because that's a specific thing <laughs> Do we have art therapists here? Yeah, we've got two. <laughs> so I also encourage people to reach out, if you are doing art, reach out to other art therapists and just, you know, for some guidance or whatnot. Um, a lot of the interventions you're going to see today, um, I have either just made up out of necessity, <laughs> or sometimes I will go on Pinterest and I'll find cool art interventions, and then I'll find, I'll, then I'll figure out why they're therapeutic. <laughs> so that's what I do. I, I work at a lot of the uh, drug treatment centers um, in Malibu, the big fancy ones. Um, so I get fed really well while I'm there. <laughs> uh, so. Anyway, um, so today we're going to be creatively exploring sexuality, sexual identity, gender, and addressing shame and stigma that a lot of people uh, carry around their own sexuality and around their own identity. Um, so let's talk about exploring sexual trauma first. This is a client of mine. We'll call her Regina. Regina is, she's in her mid-60s now, and I've been seeing her for about six years. She's my pro bono client. And um, she had a lot of sexual abuse and physical and neglect, all kinds of abuse. Um, and so she feels comfortable with me. We've been working together a long time. At some point, I asked her to draw her pain. 
Now, a lot of times people will say, well, I don't know if I should have somebody draw their trauma or draw their pain because is that going to re-traumatize them? And the answer technically is no. You're not going to re-traumatize them, but you are going to bring up feelings again. You're going to bring up the feelings associated with that trauma, but drawing is intrinsically therapeutic and calming and focusing and you're in the moment. So what you're doing now is you're combining bringing up the memories of the trauma with the experience of drawing. So you're combining those together. And so you're, the more you do that, the more you have them paint their trauma or collage their trauma, the more they associate that with something that's soothing and keeping them present. And so you're going to change the emotional reaction to their trauma. You see, um, I always do, if I do bring up somebody's trauma, then I always do something to soothe it too. So in this one, what I said to her was just use lines, shapes, and colors to draw your pain. Okay. And so very uh, dynamic here. <laughs> it's powerful. It's um, pointy and aggressive. So what you want to do is you want to ask her about it. Describe this to me. You don't want to say, describe your pain to me, because then she'll go back into describing pain. She'll use the regular language. But if you ask her to describe the pictures, she'll use different language to describe that. Um, and she'll get it out. What you're doing here is you're helping her externalize. You're helping her take it out of, in her head, it's huge. Right? It's just massive. But when you give her an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, it's contained and it's externalized. And then I can also really appreciate what she's feeling. So it, it bonds us together and it gives me that sense of, okay, this is what you're experiencing. What I had her do next was then take some construction paper and create a very large Band-Aid. And so she cut that out, she cut out the Band-Aid, and I just had her place it on top of the pain. Not to, not to hide it, but to cover it, to heal it, and let it, um, to protect it while it heals. Right? And we didn't glue it down, because I, I don't want her to pretend her pain doesn't exist under there. That's <laughs> okay. Um, we should have said that. Douglas should have said, turn off your cell phones. Yeah. Um, but, you know, covering it up to protect it is powerful. Right. Here's some of the things that we're going to take a look at as we go through the interventions. We're going to take a look at who I am and how I express myself. So giving people an opportunity to do that through the artwork. Changing their beliefs and their limitations about themselves, about their sexuality, about what's OK and what's acceptable. Um, addressing their shame. Releasing and transforming fears and limitations. So much of what we deal with as therapists is about helping people address their fears. Right? And letting them get past those or confront those fears. And then we want to increase communication and intimacy because a lot of what's going on for people is about how they communicate or don't communicate with people in their lives, right? OK. Um, I want to do a quick case study for you. This is really interesting. This is a guy, uh, 55 years old. He identifies as male. He's married to a woman. He's been married for. 30 some years. Um, I saw him for about a year and a half, and I was putting this together and thinking about him, and just three days ago, he came back into <laughs> therapy. Yeah, it was so weird. I was like, I was just thinking about you. I didn't say, I'm using you in my presentation tomorrow. Um, he is also a therapist. Uh, and, um, and a teacher, and, but he also is very creative, and he does theater set design. He'll bring me pictures of his designs. He, um, he considers himself a nudist. Uh, he really enjoys being naked with other people. And, um, and it's frustrating to him because there's not a lot of places you can do that. <laughs> right. Um, and he enjoys dressing in women's clothes. He is exploring his own gender fluidity. Uh, he is exploring reaching out to 
sexual partners who are male, that he's never done that before. Now his wife and he have sort of a don't ask, don't tell policy. She's okay with it. She's not really interested in sex anymore. So she's okay if he explores it outside of the marriage, but she just doesn't really want to hear about it. Um, and there was something else I was going to tell you about him. I forget. Okay, so I just want to show you a number of things that he did. Uh, this one is just exploring his own feelings about uh, his own gender and connections to being male, being female, where does that lie? So what, what we started off with here is a little, uh, just a little cardboard cutout of a um, sort of gingerbread man shape. Right? You can buy these at arts and craft stores or online, or you can make one yourself. And then I gave him markers and crayons, and you can see fabric here and ribbon and stuff. And I said, just create your male self on one side, and then he flipped it over to the other side and create your female self. So you could see the two coming through on the back. But just that this was such an interesting project for him to take a look at. You know, I have both of these attributes of myself, and they exist on the same person, but sometimes in different planes, depending on what I'm showing to other people. If you guys have any questions, yeah, I was just going to say, if you have any questions, <laughs> just toss them at me. It's yeah, go ahead. It's interesting that both have that like, center cutoff with a bow or with a, uh, whatever the piece is on the left, uh -huh. the belt or whatever. Uh -huh. So yeah, so you know, sometimes um, in art therapy school, we're told, OK, that could be an indicator of sexual abuse or something. But um, I, I think it was more about maybe tying it together. I don't know. But that would, be, that would be a really good question to ask him or to point out, right? To say, I noticed that both, um, both images have this centerpiece on the waist. You know, what does that mean to you? Right. Um, uh, one of the misnomers about art therapy is that we can look at somebody's artwork and interpret it. Psychic. Right? We're psychic. We're like reading tarot cards. But that's not true. It's really about sort of finessing the right, dis um, the right intervention and then asking the right questions to start communication. And, you know, 27 years or whatever of doing this, I'm really good at asking questions. And I know with my students and my interns sometimes, they're like, ah, I don't know what questions to ask. So you'll see in some of these, I did give you lists of questions to ask after. Uh, OK, so this was really interesting. This was, I had him do a Venn diagram. And on the left side, the circle on the left side was meant to represent the sexuality or part of himself that he shows to the outside world. And then the other side was what he keeps to himself. And then in the center is, you know, sometimes what he shares with others. Now, it's very complicated, so I'm going to read what he wrote about it. OK, because it was, it was very thoughtful the way he, um, the way he described it. OK, so here's what he said. So the left circle here, he says, is my sexual identity. There are four domains that are all very interconnected, gender role, sexuality, identity, and expression. So I think it was gender role, sexuality, identity, and expression. And the role of creativity in my own identity. Then he says that brown line that goes through the middle is my masculinity. The circle with the square is my creative self. So that's way over on the right side there. The right circle is where I share my sexuality with others. Oh, I had it backwards. OK, so this is what he doesn't share with others, and that's what he does share with them. Sorry about that. Um, the clock, you can see the clock in the upper right side. The clock is my diminishing abilities. I'm aware that I am aging and I have pain and physical limitations. So this, that's the other thing I wanted to tell you. He has a lot of physical pain, like back pain. So it limits him from being able to do a lot of physical things, but also, um, you know, just in the world, but also sexually. Uh, so... Age and time is affecting my sense of sexual self. 
The brown and the flowers are my masculine and feminine abilities that I allow others to see. The circle is all the aspects of my true sexual self in containment, and the container is cracked and has a box and an empty hole. So that's that far circle on the lower right. I don't completely hide the struggle from people who know me, though I do try to keep it contained. What is sad for me is that I no longer have as much energy for this struggle. I want to continue to grow and come out of my shell, but the realities of pain and diminishing health may be a task to be completed in my next lifetime. I think it is interesting that the hidden sense of self is so much more interesting than the other side. So he's talking about this side has so much more going on than what he shows others. Being nude with other people is very important to me. I have been a nudist uh, all my life. I've been to nudist resorts several times. One of my earliest childhood memories is my mother holding and rocking me as I was naked and wrapped in a towel. I think that memory is very calming for me. So I just thought that was so fascinating. We would never have picked up that if he hadn't then done it and then written about it. And what I, one of the questions I always ask is what memories or thoughts came up for you while you were making this? Because giving somebody crayons, markers, pencils, you know, things that maybe they use more in their childhood are going to stimulate uh, memories. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, go ahead. Do you have your clients write about each piece of art after they make it so that you can kind of keep a log of what their reaction was and how they interpreted it? Or is that something that just kind of comes organically? OK, that's a really good question. It depends on what context I'm seeing my clients in. All right. Um, so for some, some, they like to journal about it. They like to take it home and journal about it. And if that's the case, they can take a picture of it on their phone and take it home. Or they can take it home, and I can take a picture of it so I can keep it. Um, I actually see some clients through a therapy app. So they're always writing to me anyway. <laughs> so, um, so I have a log of that. If anybody's interested in a therapy app, I'm happy to talk to you about it too, because um, it's a great source of reaching out to people who maybe can't get themselves into your office. Um, OK, so this is also him, uh, Sam. But he did a soul collage talking about his feminine self. And who's familiar with soul collage? Familiar. You've done soul collage? It's S-O-U-L collage. It was created by Cena Frost. Um, and, you know, we've all done magazine collages where we cut out pictures and glue them next to each other. This is much more intense where you choose a background and then you choose maybe four or five different images and you carefully cut them out. You can see how this person was really cut out around the edge. And so you take it out of the context that it was in and you put it into the environment that you want it to exist in. And then it really creates this very aesthetically powerful uh, image. Is it a so. process or is it an app? Or so it's a process, yeah. So you're actually cutting out images. And the way I do it, and I'll show you a couple others um, a little in a, in a moment. But the way I do it is I cut out magazine pictures. I'll sit in front of the TV for an hour or two once a month and cut out pictures and then, but I don't carefully cut them out. I just cut them out in squares and then people can do the specific cutting. But that way you're taking them out of context in the magazine. You know, because let's say somebody wants a picture of an apple and they want it because it represents healthy, but the picture of the apple came from a magazine article about pesticides and how they're giving us cancer. So then they're not going to want to use that apple. But if I take it out of context, then they can give it whatever meaning they want. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. So the soul collage is a really powerful um, technique. And, and they're small. They're like this big, which is really neat. So they're intimate and they're something you can feel comfortable with. And uh, you can check out soulcollage.com or, or uh, Sina has a book on soul collage. It's called Soul Collage, Intuitive Process. Uh, <laughs> she just recently passed away, like maybe a year ago. Um, OK, and now it's your turn. All right, so just like Oprah, 
if you look under your seats, <laughs> you guys have some markers and crayons. And so I always think that it's really important if you're going to ask somebody else to make art that you have to have uh, experienced it yourself. Oh, you don't have, oh, yeah, so you guys have to share. I didn't bring enough for everybody. But I did give you some, um, I gave you some uh, uh, blank paper. So find that. How many people are nervous about doing a drawing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think most people say to me when, they, when I ask them to draw? I can't draw. Yeah, right. 90%, right? Right? My art therapist in the room, 90% of people will say I can't draw. And literally, you are writing notes. That means you have the ability to draw. <laughs> um, what is the next thing people tell me? The only thing I can draw is? Yes, a stick figure. So, um, yeah, for years and years, I was like, draw more than a stick figure. Don't draw stick figures. And finally, I was like, you know, after so many people telling me I can't draw more than a stick figure, I went, all right, challenge accepted. Let's start with a stick figure. So that's what I want you guys to do. You can use the markers, crayons, whatever you have. Um, so share with each other. And literally, I just want you, nothing more um, detailed than what you see right here. I just want you to draw a stick figure, OK? No, it does not have to be exactly like it. But I really don't, I want you to think almost like your really resistant client who's like, this is all I'm going to do. So, <laughs> yeah, you should totally be done with your stick figure by now. Okay, <laughs> don't put any more effort into it. But you're not done with your drawing, right? I'm, I had this set up so it was all nice and timed, but it's not going to work on this format. So, I'm going to give you the directions, but know that the directions are in your handouts, okay? Um, the next thing I'd like you to do is I'm going to have your stick figure holding something. So now you are welcome to use whatever colors you want and it can be as detailed as you want or simple. It could be as simplistic as you want. So you're just going to have your stick figure holding something. All right, the next thing you're going to draw is your stick person standing on something. So they need to be standing on something. You can also see by having the right environment and the right materials can make a big difference. You know, it's easier to sit at a table or have a clipboard. Your next step is to have your stick person wearing something. Wearing something. Okay, your next thing is to have, uh, to draw something next to or beside your stick person. Something next to or beside them. The next one is you're going to have your stick person now dropping something or letting go of something. So either dropping or letting go of something. Now you're going to have your stick person wearing something else. Wearing something else. That's up to you. I like that it's vague like that. <laughs> and finally, you're going to put something above your stick person. Draw something above. Not what? Not no, that's up to you too. Yeah. Um, so something above, and also I'm going to give you a couple extra minutes to add anything else that you think that this drawing might need that I didn't suggest. So uh, you draw something above, and then draw something or anything else that you feel that you need in this drawing. So here's all your directives. And you have that in your handouts. So in the interest of time, I know we're very limited on time today, um, you can continue to draw as we talk. Uh, I want to toss it out to you. What was that experience like for you? It was fun. It was fun. OK. It was kind of a surprise. I had like a farmer thing going on. <laughs> So you had a theme come up of, of a farmer. Interesting. Oh, oh, OK. Well, so it's an environmentally aware farmer. Very good. <laughs> Does any, did anybody else find that, that a theme developed in their drawing? Oh, OK. OK. I love the rain, but yet I'm holding a flower on the outside on grass. 
So it's just things you really like. Would you say that your stick person turned into you then? <laughs> How many people would admit their stick person became them? Eh, yeah, see? Isn't it interesting? People are so determined. You will not get any information out of me because all I can draw is a stick person. And, you know, if I had said to you, I want you to draw a person who's standing on something and wearing something and, you know, dropping something and all that, um, it would have been overwhelming. But since I'm giving it to you one step at a time, like everything in life, you break it down into small steps, it feels doable, right? Um, was anybody surprised by anything that they drew? <laughs> okay, and what was that? <laughs> I know I can't draw. You know I'm, I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I can paint and do collage mm -hmm. and mixed media. But, you know, it was supposed to be a bird and it ended up like a missile. So, <laughs> 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 it was not my intention was bird. It came out being a missile. So we'll talk about that later, yeah. Victoria. <laughs> That's a whole session there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so these are some of the questions that I would ask. I would ask about what was the process like for you. I would ask about did it become you? Uh, are you surprised by anything? Um, I would ask you to maybe share the story that developed or the theme that developed for you. And then what was your experience of doing the drawing? Like you had said it was fun. For some people maybe it caused anxiety. For other people maybe, you know, it, um, it they were very focused. Maybe other people are just like, yeah, I just want this to be done with. You know, so what I find is the way that people respond to the artwork, even something this simple, is usually how they respond to life. So if I have somebody who's like, this is just making me so angry. Okay. <laughs> what else in life right now is making you angry? I had, I had a 23-year-old a girl saying that in my group yesterday. She's like, I cannot do this. It's just really pissing me off. It's making me angry. And I'm like, stay with it. Just do it. Because there are so many things in life that are going to make you way more angry than this. It's a good chance to tolerate your frustration, <laughs> to learn to tolerate your frustration and not explode with it. So that's always a good question to ask. Go ahead. I had something kind of interesting happen. I actually can draw. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and what I found during this was like, I'm like, oh, I super don't care about this. Yeah. So it made it like, instead of being like, oh, I hope this torso isn't too long or yeah. something like that, I was just like, this is fun, and this is colors, and who cares, and it's silly. <laughs> so you so let I'm go like, of the expectations, yeah. which is such a great life lesson, too, because when our expectations are this high, our, our um, Happiness is down here, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and I do find it's more difficult to work with artists because they have expectations of what it should look like, right? I mean, we all judge our art. I mean, even she said, I can't draw, and which most of you will say. But we all judge our art. But I feel like artists use, use colors and shapes as a um, language already. And so it's just a little harder, but it's not impossible. Anyway, so this is a really fun one. I love doing this with people. Uh, this is a great one to do with clients over and over again if you have long-term clients, you know, so you can see how it changes. Any questions on that? Okay. It's very simple, very straightforward. As you can see, it doesn't matter what materials you use. You know, some of you had markers, some of you had crayons. Um, Okay, let's move on. This, uh, this was uh, the very first person that I showed you, Regina. This is her um, stick person drawing. So she has, she's diagnosed bipolar, and she's dropping a yo-yo, which I thought was very interesting, up and down. What? Yeah, yeah. What, are, what were other people dropping? I always find that one really interesting. I was dropping tears, because you said, what are you letting go? Yes, I said you could be letting go of or dropping, because I thought it could float up or it could dissipate. And instead everything of, else was positive. Yeah. So I think in order to have the positive, I have to let go of the tears. Yeah, or the loss or the sadness or, you know, whatever the tears represent. Nice. What else were people dropping or letting well, go? I have that and a question, so I yeah, have to go teach for it. you. Um, <laughs> which, huh, I, I, I tried to do the first thing that popped into my yeah. head. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I didn't. Yeah, and I was analyzing, obviously, as I was doing it. You I can't help not right. doing it, exactly. yeah. I don't know if it meant anything. But also, is there a perfect, like you said, also the thing sitting, 
sitting next to you. I did a dog too. Which is <laughs> this girl. Like, do you, a lot of people do. I don't know. I've heard of house tree person. <laughs> yeah. It's like, does everything kind of have a correlation? Well, for this one, I just made it up. Okay. <laughs> okay? But I tried to get something above, below, side, holding, you know, clothes, whatever. Um, so I think that it can speak to a lot of different things. But the only, to answer your question, does everything have a meaning or a correlation? Um, it does if you give it to it. You know, um, so when I would do this with a client or with a group, then I would have each person go through and they would talk about each thing and they would talk about how it relates to them right now. Yeah. So Regina's dropping never drops. Yeah, yeah, which you don't have to. Right. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. That's a good question. I have not done research. How many people are holding something in the right hand? Or how many people stick person is holding something in the right hand? No, it looks like half, maybe. Yeah. I'm right handed and mine's in my left hand. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, yeah. I guess that's true. That's true. Or right if you're looking at it and then. Yeah. Yeah. So what? <laughs> yeah. That would be an interesting research study to do. All right. Um, this is, I, I think you guys will find this uh, intervention really um, unique and interesting. What I did was I, di I had my clients do four different small collages. So they are about, um, I don't know, four by six each size. Um, they did a collage about love. They did a collage about passion, a collage about sexuality, and a collage about shame. Now, all of these are done in the same session. They're very small. And what they're using is um, a lot of the cardstock colored paper, right? Just, uh, and maybe some pattern paper. Um, and so again, the language that I use is using shapes and colors, collage love or collage what shame would look like. So I just wanted to um, share why I'm doing this. This gives people the... Uh, opportunity to share their fears and create vulnerability and connection because when I'm going to share my shame with you or my sex with you or my sexual identity with you I have to open up I have to be a little bit vulnerable and the way that we decrease shame is by sharing and hearing somebody else say me too me too, I've experienced that, or I've felt that. The way we increase shame is by keeping it a secret, right? That comes from Brene Brown. She does a lot of work on shame and that shame, uh, shame and guilt. So anyway, this gives people an opportunity to share their desires, their fantasies, uh, see connections between sex and shame and where that comes up, challenge social norms, change perspectives and emotional charge, and make up your own rules. So I mean, you can take a look. Now, all these were done by the same person. This was Bridget. She, she was about um, mid-20s. Uh, so her loved one was, I love using, I love providing um, maps, like old maps. Because, yeah, because no one uses maps anymore. <laughs> we all use our GPS, right? And um, they're beautiful. Maps are really beautiful. And this idea of, you know, having a map or a goal to get somewhere or using old maps that aren't going to take us to where we wanted to go because the roads are different now. I mean, there's a whole bunch of metaphors. But anyway, she found a map um, outside of Chicago that was her hometown. So she, uh, she highlighted that and she had a lot of love for her hometown and her childhood. Passion, I find that a lot of people will use that sort of, um, sh that sort of explosion shape for passion. Um, sex, you can see she made a giant penis there, <laughs> and she wrote 69. And then for the shame, she combined the hearts from love and the sex from sex, and she, she combined these together, and you can see uh, gave her an opportunity to talk about how some of her shame came from her childhood and some of her shame came from her sex and uh, being a sexual person. So very simple, they're just using markers and they're using uh, colored paper. 
This is another example of, of the same thing. Four different collages, all done by the same person. This is a woman who was in her mid-40s. The top one is her collage about love. Her uh, top right is collage about passion. Then uh, she talked about, I think there's a candle in the passion, and those, again, those exploding shapes. And then for sex, you have sort of this yin-yang shape, this balance of you know equal but separate, and then sort of this kind of maybe penis shape or sperm or uterus or you know kind of interesting um, shape that sort of goes through that. And then for her shame, she actually used a paper lunch bag that she crumpled up. I love using paper lunch bags too. I like that texture and that color. So she crumpled up the paper lunch bag and then um, created a, sort of a circle. It looks very vaginal, doesn't it? And then she took a black, uh, yeah, it was like, a, she, used, she colored it in black there. But you could see how the, the colors and the shapes repeat themselves. So she has a, the same background in love and shame. She has um, some of the same shapes in different things. So you can see how those overlap. And it really gives an opportunity for them to talk about uh, how these four things connect for them. So some of the questions that I would ask after doing this is, what feelings came up for you while you were creating your collage? This is, again, my go-to question. Uh, what would you like to share about your collages? How would you define love? How would you define passion? How would you define sex? How would you define shame? Are there any shapes or colors that occur in more than one collage? And is there a relationship between sex and shame for you, and how, and explain why? So this was a, a young man's early 20s. He said that love should be a 50-50 thing. He said passion. Passion, he also found a map from his hometown. He was really into his sports team. So, you know, his passion was about his football team. Uh, sex for him, he, he found a sparkly piece of paper and made a dog collar. That's what he said that was. No, not, a, he was very specific about it. It was, see, and this, that's really important. If you don't ask and make assumptions, you will get really different uh, interpretation there. And then his shame was about this crow, you know, this sort of crow, um, something evil out there. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's all in one session, and they're very small. They're, there's like four by six, so they're really small, and they're, um, so they, they can rip the paper, they can cut the paper, so it's not like a lot of time goes into it. Yeah, and, yeah, go for it. Do you use sexuality or sex? Sex. Okay. Yeah, because I want it to be more about the act of having sex. So there's love, there's passion, uh, and I change this, in this slide, I did change it to sexuality, but um, I thought his shame was interesting. Again, he used that paper lunch bag, and he put a face on it to represent like putting a bag over your face and being like a sort of a generic hiding kind of thing. Yeah. Um, all right, I, I have so much I want to share with you, and I know I'm running out of time. Um, <laughs> this is an opportunity to give people a chance to uh, gain a new skill and also express themselves. So I might say to them, create something that you know you really want to explore in your own sexuality or your own sexual identity. Or um, like for uh, for the central one, the one with the lips. That was a step-by-step -step painting. Anybody ever go to those uh, paint and wine nights? <laughs> they, they walk you through a painting. Like literally, they'll say, put a line here, and then mix these two colors together and paint this area. So I, I did this with a group of people. We painted that, uh, those lips step-by-step, -step, and it gave them this opportunity to learn how to paint come out with something that they felt really good about painting and, um, and to be able to follow directions and then have something that was really passionate. And the same thing with learning to draw the figure or uh, even the one on the far right. I had some different cutout shapes that they could trace and 
put together. Um, so learning to follow directions and giving them something that in the end looks really good and they can express themselves in a safe way is really empowering for people. This was her fantasy. She, she was like, she really wanted to explore uh, bondage with her partner, but she was scared to talk about it. And so it gave her the opportunity to share that with me and then talk about how we can, how she can then confront or not confront, but address that issue with her partner. So how, doing this activity and uh, people who have been sexually abused, adults who have been raped. Great. So that's a whole other thing. I was, I was here last year doing a whole thing on sexual abuse. But yeah, like, you know, a lot of these things, I might not give them that technique if they've had trauma around sex, right? So, but we do want to help them bring back their passion. We do want to help them move past the trauma and regain the passion around their own sexuality and their sexual experiences. So, like, um, the lips one was really kind of special because I we started off with black paper and then I had them with chalk draw the lips and I actually had some stencils that they could do it from if they felt like they couldn't do it. And then I had them, before they started painting, write a wish inside the lips and then they painted over it. So then there's, then it's this idea of this wish is now embedded in the painting about their passion. So that's kind of a very simple, sweet thing to do. Right? All right, um, this is another soul collage about who do I want to be. So this one, um, I asked this client to choose a bunch of things that they felt passionate about. So they were passionate about movies. And this is actually a, um, yeah, it's a shish kebab. It's a, yeah, so they were, they were passionate about food, right? They wanted to put some food in there. And I think there's another shish kebab down in yeah. there at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> and then this idea of just like leaping and jumping. And so just what does passion look like for you? And where do you feel it, you know, in different places? You know, when I meet somebody for the first time, instead of asking them, what do you do? Because then it, people tell me their job, right? I oftentimes will say, what are you passionate about, right? And then they, a lot of times they still go to, I'm passionate about my job, but, which is fine, which is fine. Um, this is another um, soul collage about expressing their passion. Um, but some of the questions that I would ask would be, again, what feelings came up for you while you were creating this? What do you like? What do you not like? And that could be what do you like in this collage or what do you not like in this collage, but it could also be what do you like in life and what do you not like, right? What are you attracted to? What are your fantasies that you want to explore? What are new aspects of your sexuality that you want to explore? So different questions. And, and so often, just having something else to look at to answer those questions is safer than having to look at me and answer those questions directly. Right. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna go through this one. This is really interesting, uh, another thing that I just made up, where you know how we tell our clients you need to sit in your feelings? You need to, but what does that actually mean? So I have them write out this poem, uh, and you guys have an example of that in, in your handouts, where they feel their feeling through every sense. So in this case, uh, my client Lisa was dealing with anxiety. So I had her identify what color anxiety was and go through. What does it taste like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And where does it come from? So writing that all out, it forces them to sit in that feeling. Right? And a lot of what I do is problem solution. Right? And um, so I have them do this. And then the second part of this is now I want you to choose the opposite of that feeling. So for Lisa, the opposite of anxiety was relaxation. Now I told her she, could, she was to choose the opposite of anxiety, but she had to keep the same color. Now we all intuitively want to switch colors. Yucky feeling, yucky color, nice feeling, nice color. But I made her keep the same color and then go through and experience uh, and sit in the relaxation. What does it taste like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Now, why do you think I would force people to keep the same color? Because anxiety is still going to come in some form. It's not, and you're the same. You're the color. 
Right. The feeling is the color. Right. So, so you are the person, or that color is the thing that connects anxiety and relaxation, or whatever your two feelings are. It could be trauma and safety, you know, whatever the feelings that they choose. Also, uh, yeah, like you could see, she used purple here, she used purple here. She didn't want to. She was a little bit mad at me that I made her keep purple. Also, what I want her to realize is that she identified purple as anxiety. She gave it that meaning. She has the, she has the ability to switch perspectives, to change things, to see them differently. And that's where her power comes from. That's where the ability to shift comes from, right? And so they go through that. Go ahead. Well, that's a good question, right? So a lot of times, and I've done this with hundreds of clients because I do it in big groups of people. Um, and oftentimes people will say, I was able to find positive things about this color that I identified as yucky. Like I had one, one guy who, he, uh, he picked up for his ugly color, he picked up the ugliest yellowish, brownish, pukey color, right? And then when he started writing the, the opposite positive feeling, he looked at the crayon and it was gold, <laughs> right? So sometimes you have that really powerful thing. Now, I usually follow this up with put the poem away and now draw a picture of anything. So, um, and they can use whatever colors they want. And in that case, and this is what Lisa drew after she still used purple. And in that case, if she had wanted to use green as her opposite color, she now has the opportunity to give herself the color that she wanted before. Yes, it's very zen, it's very relaxed. You can see she incorporated a lot of things, music and flowers and nature and all the things she had written. You always want to do the yucky feeling first and the nice feeling last, and then cement the nice feeling with the drawing. Right. Yeah. OK, I'm going to skip this because I know we're getting to the end. But um, I am happy to talk about or answer questions afterwards. This is a really fun one where I got really into arrows recently. And, <laughs> and I was thinking about the metaphor of arrows. Let me go back here. Um, the metaphor of arrows being direction, strength, focus, movement, protection, hunting, and then there was another one that's not on there. Um, and, uh, oh, um, violence, but also love, like, you know, um, Cupid's arrow, we just had Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> and then the idea of the, of the bow and arrow, that the farther back you pull the, the bow and the more tension you feel, the more potential it has to move forward. So I tell my clients that when you feel like you're being pulled back and there's more and more tension, that is life telling you that you just have that much more potential to move forward if you use that energy in the right way. So I had them, we went through all that, we looked at pictures of arrows, then I had them draw four arrows, and then you can see I had them create these, uh, just draw balloons at the top. We painted them with watercolors. We took straws and kind of blew the watercolor paint so it's sort of exploding there. You can see that. And so the arrows, in essence, are popping the balloon that we identified as fear. And then we wrote on the arrows, what are the things that are going to destroy your fear? And this person had written fellowship, love, hope, and faith. So just very simple but um, powerful. This person was destroying their fear with support, gratitude, and passion. So anyway, um, final thoughts here. Some of the things that I have my clients always focus on is be curious. You know, be curious, try new things, be aware of what your intentions are at all times. What are your intentions and how do your behaviors affect other people? Embrace who you are because you have intrinsic value. So many of our clients don't believe that about themselves. Right? Be in control of your perspective and what you choose because that's the only thing we really have control over. Right? So I'm Pamela Melkoff-Hayes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>